Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Dr. Bio Okomalafe. In a sense, the fugitive answers the question that is hidden within the words of my elders when they say, in order to find your way, you must become lost. Bio Komalafe PhD, rooted with the Yoruba people in a more than human world, is the father to Alethea and Kaya, the grateful life partner to EJ, son and brother. A widely celebrated international speaker, post-humanist thinker, poet, teacher, public intellectual, essayist, and author of two books, These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, Letters to My Daughter on Humanity's Search for Home, and We Will Tell Our Own Story, The Lions of Africa Speak. Bio Komalafe is the visionary founder of the Emergence Network and host of the online post-activist course, We Will Dance with Mountains. Oh, Bio, I am just so darn excited to be with you again, exploring the edges and connecting. I just appreciate you and our last conversation on the podcast was so, uh, so moving. It definitely left me shook and I know so many of our listeners were too. So I'm really looking forward to this. It's uh, wonderful to be with you again, Ayana. Looking forward to this, this mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. The second time's a charm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard. Uh, Me too. <laughs> so I want to start off by reading a quote from your multi-form essay, Coming Down to Earth. And it goes like this, quote, We now live in fugitive times. And fugitive times require fugitive epistemologies, or ways of knowing. Deploying the settler epistemologies that contributed to the geo-ecological hostilities of the present risks reinforces the dynamics we want to address. The promise of fugitivity, as we shall see, is that in a sense it helps resacralize the world, ministering to our weary bones by drawing God closer. So intimately close, in fact, that we lose some of the categorical independence modernity burdened us with. Hmm. I know I'm starting off with a a deep one, but there is so much in that quote that I want to explore more. One being, what is it to live in fugitive times that require fugitive epistemologies? You know, I've heard you speak the word fugitive many times, and I feel so drawn to it. Mm Mm-hmm. But I'm not really sure that I understand it more than mm, like body understanding, like an intuitive maybe understanding, but I'd love to hear you speak to that. Right. Well, you could think about the fugitive as a mode of navigating the world, a, a way of knowing, right? Modern epistemologies are forward facing. Um, they centralize the knower, right? And they often thrive on what some philosophers would call representationalism. That is the, the presumption that the world is outside, external. And our work is to adequately represent it, right, in our ideas, in our language, in our concepts, to bring it in, so to speak, to traverse the ontological gap between our skins and the environment, right? Um, And that's the task of modernity. Um, That way of knowing is costly, right? And and this is the idea then, that that if if you perform knowing, and notice I said, perform, right? That, that knowing is always a corporeal, embodied, tactile relating with the world that is always risky, that is always speculative, that is always experimental, and it's always political, right? When we know the world in ways that um, centralize us as prime knowers, 
Um, one of the speculative costs of that is that we tend to see the environment as instrumental, as dumb and mute and only there for our use. Right? And that is why some writers and authors and speakers uh, you know, bring that kind of thinking in as complicit in the production of the troubles we're experiencing as a civilization today, the Anthropocene. So to, to, to know, um, you know, fugitively, if you will, is to come alive to other senses. It, it's to, I, I hesitate to use the word awaken um, because it also presumes a binary. <laughs> Uh, between wakefulness and sleepfulness, if you will. Um, but it is, to, it is to navigate the world differently. There's a sense called uh, you know, proprioception, right? In, in, in which we kind of, uh, our muscles, the way we move in the world, and the way we situate ourselves in space-time is, um, is, is what's at stake, right? Um, that sense of proprioception, I like to think of um, knowing as proprioceptive, that how you move through the world makes the world and makes knowledge. Knowledge is not just a stable, objective thing out there, you know, at the end of a scientifically rigorous exercise. Knowledge is how we meet the world and how the world meets us in return. So fugitivity is really this political project or maybe political on project that is about a call, a conjuring, an invitation to lose our way from the human, Ayana, the human. And I'm capitalizing the human here, the way Hortense Spillers might do it, the way um, uh, Sylvia Winters might do it, the way C.L.R. James might do it, those Caribbean philosophers um, uh, the way uh, Wale Shoenka might do it. it uh, it's, it's the idea that the human itself is not the anthropomorphic figures we're used to, you know, uh, the figures and shapes we're used to. The human is a territory. It's a way of acting and thinking and believing. It's a mode of individuation. It's, it's a way of desiring. It's an imaginative economy. It's a political imaginary, right? And this political imaginary is becoming toxic, right? It's a way of knowing. It's a colonial imperial order. It, had, it, it has its legacies in the Atlantic middle, in the slave ship. What fugitivity is inviting is projects of exile, right? That move us away from the dissociative uh, escape or transcendence of the modern and closer, as I write in that passage, to God, where God is not Gandalf or some bearded white dude on a throne in some distant fairyland, but God speculatively becomes the unbecoming, the becomingness of things, the unraveling, the teenage promiscuity of things uh, that. Uh, this promiscuity is so severe and powerful and potent and vibrant that we can no longer even speak about a universe. That presupposes one thing. We can't even speak about a multiverse because that presupposes that numbers are stable categories. So I like to think of it as an indeterminiverse, that the world or the universe or something, world, word fail at this point, uh, crumble entirely that the world or the universe is still figuring itself out, right? And so the fugitive is the figure of the Anthropocene, a political invitation to unlearn mastery, to fall to the earth, to learn how to commune with soil, to disturb our social analytics that tends to centralize justice, to move beyond critique, right? To notice how even protest could be a, a department in the slave plantation. 
and to travel, to get lost. In a sense, the fugitive answers the question that is hidden within the words of my elders when they say, in order to find your way, you must become lost. Thank you for taking us there from the very beginning. I was definitely getting lost in your words and I imagined myself falling to earth and feeling so held by the ground in this this longing, this yearning, like crying out to be held in a fugitive way. And I'm thinking about you speaking about God and what it is to draw God closer. And I think this is an interesting topic for me right now, especially because I think about God and spirituality. And of course, in different times in human history, God was a lot more important seemingly than they are now. And I think that this type of post-modernity, post-spirituality, post-God world is not good for us in a lot of ways. Like, without God, what holds us accountable? Without God, how do we live in right relationship? When I say God, it can mean so many things, but I want to pause there and just Mm-hmm. ask for you to speak about God more and maybe reflect on what it has been for us humans to lose that intimate connection with God and how mm-hmm. do we come back or find new ways of relating to that type of life force or source to belonging. Hmm. I think I would source my response from Catherine Keller, um, and who is a theologian um, and a brilliant thinker uh, that I really deeply respect. And she speaks about the the traditions. Um, I could prop, I could never speak about these matters in in the same. Um, vain as she does, but she speaks about the the apophatic and the cataphatic. Uh, th- these were and are traditions of uh, coming to understand the notion of God, where the cataphatic is the is the you might call it the ancient um, acknowledgement of God that is populated by statements. Um, that, you know, are about what God is, right? So you can say God is good. God is great. God is huge. God is kind. God is wonderful. God is infinite. And all these are positive statements, right? Um, they, They are, even to say God is evil in this sense, a positive statement, you have something to say about God, something definite that is about uh, God's attributes. And I use his most of the time because I grew up in a tradition that was more comfortable um, thinking about God as a as a male, right? Um, even though I had my seditious moments, um, and it's not even sedition, right? <laughs> because there are many p- places in the Christian text um, where God speaks about um feeding you know breasts to his children or to her children like a mother and i really loved that anyway i digress um so those are cataphatic statements and then there there's a different tradition ancient tradition that is apophatic uh, that is situated in this idea that the more we say things about god the more we lose the sense of godness Right, because God is infinite and God is God is beyond sane. Right, the, the moment you try to say God is something or God isn't something, you you um, or rather God is something, not isn't in this in this sense. You you lose you postpone God. You kind of lose the the sense of potency that comes with. Uh, the negative theologies. So apophatic 
theologies are negative theologies. They're, they're more like God isn't, right? And the idea is to withdraw more and more and more away from any positive statement that can be made about God in the hope that by and by we might be engulfed by this godhood, right? We might be taken back by this infinite nothingness that is also infinite somethingness, right? But that escapes language so thoroughly as to discipline our attempts to name God. Um, and what Catherine Keller does with this concept is to, is to rework it, right? So she calls it apophatic entanglement. And what she wants to do is to put God to work in a different way so that it's not just a sailing into a, a Socratic or Platonic nothingness. Instead, what she wants to do is to bring God down to earth, to, to make God in some sense synonymous with the loss of image, the loss of, of the familiar, the fugitive breakthroughs, you know, that tantalizes from the wild edges, that God is not so much the temple as he is the mad man outside the temple, you know, conjuring and babbling and inviting us to seditious playgrounds. The God is God is the breakthrough. God is the crack, right? So I, I often think about God together with Catherine Ke Keller as a godding, right? I put a gerund after God, that God is not just some stable uh, figure that holds the objective moral universe in place. You know, to, to, to think of that way, to think about God in that way is to, is to risk imperial um, narratives and imperial dynamics um, to, 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 to think that one needs to appease an external figure, right, that is outside of our bodily entanglements, that it's outside of lichen and microbial and mycorrhizal and rhizomatic becomings, that is, in a sense, to, um, to capture God in a, in a knowable way. Right. So the, uh, the, the Kellarian um, idea of a, an unknowable God really appeals to me. It's, it's the idea that God is still figuring itself, herself, himself, themselves out. God is still being worked out. God is not just an essence. God is a becoming. God is a dying. God is a living. God is the animacy of of a mushroom world. God is the weather. God is geology. And this is not just to say in a glib way that God is everything, because there's no such thing as everything. That's just a convenience of language. Um, there's no umbrella term to capture things that are happening in their happenings, right? There is only this convenience um, of, of, of speaking and words. So I like to think about God in this way, as fugitive, as the crack in things that disciplines our attempts to name with any sense of finality. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I appreciate the uncapturability <laughs> or the like. Just, <laughs> no, you're spinning words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like we can't hold God. It's um, there's. Like I'm just seeing God fall through my fingers as you're speaking. And there's some relief in that. And there's some nervousness in that as well for me. Good. <laughs> but I guess there's this gnawing question that keeps coming to me, which is something around accountability or justice or right relationship or what holds us humans what holds us? What contains us? How do we hold ourselves accountable? Who do we serve, mm -hmm. um, if not God? And wanting to bring up that justice, accountability, being good at this point in our post-modernity, mm -hmm. who holds us? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a story. I think I'll answer it this way. There's a story 
um, and it's not entirely apocryphal. Um, and it's not entirely archetypal to there's something experimental about it. And I might have a little something to do with that. But there's a story about um, the, arriving, the arriving of the slave ships to the African continent and the stealing of Africans, women, children, men, um, to those ships, uh, cargo ships. Um, one story is in response to the question, well, where were our gods? You know, why didn't they do something about this? One response is that, well, one god tried to do something. His name, Ogun. And Ogun is the god of metal, iron. You know, he's the god of victory. And it is said that Ogun um, marshaled and galvanized and brought together uh, or, or an army to chase down these slavers, to chase them away. Um, but as he headed to the beach, he was met by his brother, Ishu. And Ishu is a trickster. Ishu is mischievous. It, when one prays, you pray issue, come close, but not too close. So that sense of <laughs> that sense of um, of intimacy and distance and irony and paradox and complexity is sensed in this engagement with archetypal flows and what the Yoruba people um, figure as issue. It is said that Ogun met issue and issue. Um, regaled him with stories and stuff and served him palm wine and eventually succeeded at putting him to sleep, his brother putting Ogun to sleep. Uh, and then brought in the ships even closer, stole into those sheep, uh, ships and I said sheeps, uh, stole into those ships and traveled across the Atlantic with the slaves, um, which doesn't make for a happy ending, right? If you're to say that within a traditional social justice forum, um, because it's a story of complicity. It's a troubling account of our own gods doing us in. But there's, there's a thing about tricksters and how they defy moral stabilities. In some sense, moral stability emerges in the wake of the trickster's adventures. And that's one way of seeing the world as open and experimental, but not so open that anything goes, right? That in moving and navigating through the world, um, and not just humans, other things as well, the more than human, we co-produce moral architecture, moral stabilities. Some of them we have names for. You just named a few. Good, accountable, evil, you know, turning away, a bypass, you know. Um, and, and in naming and in inhabiting and in performing those moral architectures, we place make the world, we terraform the world as we are terraformed ourselves, as we learn to acculturate ourselves to the psychic demands of these moral stabilities. But moral stabilities are also indebted to larger territorial flows. So even the concept of good and accountability and evil is also indebted to other things, the river, the libidinal flows and the archetypal algorithms that make us us are constantly migrating. And in those moments, good could become incarcerating. The very idea of good could become troubling, right? And there are many stories I can tell you, uh, but the most famous familiar one is the story in Things Fall Apart and how this culturally stable um, setting with your coherence and just the attempt of, 
of the protagonist trying to live true to those moral demands on his person creates trouble, which tells me, and I think to any other reader, that the world is imbued with irony and paradox and complexity that are not reducible to the ways we speak about things in terms of good versus evil, in terms of accountability. So this is not to dismiss any of that. It is to notice that um, those moralities are indebted to ethical flows. So this is differentiating between ethics and morality. Morality might uh, might pose the question of what should we do, but ethics is about what comes to matter and what comes to be excluded in the mattering of what comes to matter. I hope I'm still making some sense. So, <laughs> so um, the, the question about, um, you know, who do we answer to? What, who, who do we, who are we accountable to? Um, must be framed within the cosmovision that gave it life. If you're asking within postmodernism or modernism, which must postpone God indefinitely in order for the human to thrive, right? Then that question um, becomes urgent. But if you're dealing with a different cosmovision um, where good is just one of a number of moral archetypes that are available and is not always promising for the project of thriving on the planet, um, then other questions come into being. Then we have to situate the, trick, the trickster and ask, what is the trickster doing? How are we shifting today? What are the demands that are being placed upon us, you know, in order to be alive to the sensuous flows of the world? What could in what way, let me put it this way, in what way, and I ask this question all the time, in what way does justice stand in the way of transformation, right? In what way does being good actually come, it become an obstacle to being sensuous, right? In what way does it become an exoskeleton that chains us to the ground, you know, with a presumption that the universe is coherent, morally coherent, or to repeat the age-old phrase, uh, saying of Martin Luther King that the uh, the arc the the world or the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, right? In what sense is that true? And in what sense does the universe exceed that sentiment? Right. So, I don't think that if we think about God as an external being, we can escape the trap of good versus evil, and I call it a trap within that. Um, setting within the cosmovision I'm speaking from. But if we think about God as this ecology of trickster, of archetype, of cybernetic flows, of technologies, of monsters, of ghosts and becomings, of scabbed over oceans, of moanings, of songs, of murmurations, of rhizomes um, that are still figuring themselves out, then other questions become possible then we're no longer asking simply um, who do we kowtow to or who do we bow to? We're asking how we are co-producing those realities, those more moral realities, right? And we're asking, um, you know, what other questions are inviting us to pay attention at this point in time? worship in and I cannot allow you to mess that up. My house did not become my home. My body did and I find it hard to deny rent to demons when they are willing to pay three months in advance. Yet my home needs a renovation. It has leaks the size of God's tears until I evict my renters. My home will always, always be for sale. 
body doesn't know death as its own. It only operates as much as its souls requires. You would think after becoming earth and transforming into trees that it would understand the beauty of letting go, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's fascinating to hear your just exploring the differences between ethics and morality and as you were speaking I was trying to imagine examples of that and gosh also just really considering not just God but truth and how Mm -hmm. capital T truth also seems to have just flown out the window in Mm postmodernity and in this time Mm -hmm. so I'm I'm really holding God and truth side by side right now, mm-hmm. trying to understand what is their relationship to each other at this point. Mm. Mm. Well, um, when I was a nerd, as an undergrad, um, I had this Latin um, phrase that I can't remember. I think it's uh, veritas a something a prevalibi. It, it 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 was it translates to truth is great and shall prevail, right? And I had it inscribed on all my notes, all my class notes, all my journals. And yes, you're hearing that right. I did not have a social life. I was about the library kind of life and about the theology and psychology and Freud <laughs> and reading all of them through each other kind of life. Um, and it was not at all difficult for me to notice that to speak truth um, or to think about truth, this capital T truth, and I gave you that uh, you know, appellation as well, is to think with in very strong eschatological Christian terms. And I'm not saying this is the only way to make this connection uh, or to think about truth, right? But there's something deeply platonic about uh, thinking about the world this way. And speaking about platonic, right? This is what uh, the French philosophers Deleuze and Guattari um, refer to as arborescent thinking and or arboreal thinking. It, it's it's uh, from the you know, arboreal or borescent is to think like trees or a tree line, you know, that comes from the roots and proceeds to the less important parts, which are the branches, so to speak. And they hated thinking like trees because what that signifies basically is arborescent thinking is representational thinking. Um, it's this platonic idea that the world around us is just this roving material mass of, the, of appearances. It's phenomenon, not noumenon, right? So this is just lesser secondary stuff. There's a world, an ideal world of forms, right? Behind um, the world we're used to. And this is why we need philosopher kings in a platonic uh, city. Uh, People who are trained and disciplined to see the world as it is and not those... Uh, ravenous masses uh, that are animal um, in their senses and do not have the fine tastes of discerning truth, right? So it's this binary dualistic situation um, that sees a world of forms and a world of representations. This is aborescent thinking. So you look at a cartoon and a cartoon is a representation of a human being right? It's just an appearance, you know, a shadow is a representation of a human being. Um, And those French philosophers I named were against that kind of thinking. They were asking, what if we, instead of thinking about the world in this dualistic way, what if we allowed cartoons to do things only cartoons can do, instead of just being representatives of an ideal form, right? What if What if instead of thinking of Pinocchio as less than a real boy, we ask, what can a wooden boy do, right? (laughs) What can Pinocchio do? So this turns the tree or dismisses the tree kind of thinking, arboreal, arborescent thinking. 
And then we are introduced to rhizomes, roots, searching from different directions, where there's no origin point, where there's no destination point, where every point is originary, where every point is a destination. And every point is simultaneously a middle, right? It's performing different things at, at, at once. It's duplicitous, it's trickstery. If we think of the world as rhizomatic instead of arborescent, then the new has space to thrive. Then we can understand differences. For instance, black bodies, not as approximations of white bodies, but as ontological gifts doing their own thing. We can understand um, different kinds of families that are being proliferated around the world right now, not as uh, you know, unstable, shadowy reflections of the nuclear family, as we understand it, you know, but as family itself, exploring the meanings of family, right? It becomes rhizomatic. The world becomes uh, abundant and promiscuous and teenage, right? Now I forget your question, Ayana, because I just traced <laughs> off into my poetic... No, I, I was with you. I was... I feel like I was on the ride with you, sitting next to you and waving my arms as we would swoop down and go up. <laughs> and <laughs> I was really waving my hands here. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I was really, I was in this inquiry of truth and God and how they relate. And I think part of where I was going with that is, I guess in my mind, when I think of capital T Truth, or God, or right relationship, I think about the earth, and I think, well, it only makes sense to serve our home. And we, we can look at home as earth, as our ecosystems, as the waters that flow through where we live, the trees that give us oxygen, like we're serving our home. Instead, we're living, you know, at this point, kind of globally, the overculture is ecocidal we're killing our home and to me that seems like truth and god were like put in a blender and what has happened to the clarity that maybe some of our ancestors had that truth and god lives within the land that allows us to be alive to become like all of this becoming and even the ability to think and to perform and to imagine and to be trickster all comes from the earth allowing us to sustain life. So I would think that our moralities and our ethics would all come back to how do we protect that which allows us to live. I'm looking around this earth and the suffering and the pain and honestly just the insanity of how we have ended up here. And I want to believe that there is some trickster story that we're living through and there will be some type of something on the other side where we're like, oh, this is why we went through this mental breakdown. But I'm not sure. And I, I'm definitely not sure. So yeah, I think that's the underpinnings of this question around God and truth. You know, I really honor, I honor that and I celebrate that. It's, it's, um, I think of these insights, these concepts um, as, as world making and their consequences. And we do need that. It, it, it's, um, it's, we can say that it's 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 potentially problematically essentialist, right? Um, to to think about truth in the ways that are familiar to the modern, or even to so many indigenous groups um, around the world, even mine, right? Because uh, maybe I should put it this way with a story. Stories are always a good way to enter, but this will be briefer. Uh, this brother of mine tells me a story about um, uh, 
a group that traveled, uh, I think it's from the a First Nation um, tribe, uh, travels to China for, an, for a gathering that involves indigenous groups around the world. And I think they've been trying to re revive a project um, that is about, you know, images and connecting to the dream world and connecting to their tricksters and, and things like that um, for a long time. They're artists, but they've not found their mojo. They've not found this flow. They've not connected to ancestry. Something is missing. Well, the story goes that they are in this festival in China. Is it? Chi I think it's China, yes. And, and they are um, in dancing on the streets and they, they fall into conversation with another indigenous group and from a different part of the world. And they're just mixing and sharing experiences when it seems all of a sudden, I think how the story goes, um, one member of the former indigenous group from the Americas um, that I've been speaking about becomes possessed, so to speak. And starts to fling his arms wildly on the streets and does it so hard and so prominently that a, a police officer has to be brought in to try to contain the situation, right? But some event happens and this signals the return of a trickster that they have been waiting on in their own lands for a long time, but did not meet them in their own place, met them in the diaspora, met them in a foreign, strange place. And that night, as I've been told, all of them have dreams of images that come to them. And these images um, of what to do with their art is nothing like what they would have expected. They would have expected to maybe create masks out of the original fabrics that their ancestors um, used. But instead, they create selfies, like this trickster figure that alights upon them, inspires them to use modern images, to, to use modern uh, tools and, and, and modern objects to create the sacred, now, I just want that to sink in for a while. And, and my sense here, and that's the end of the story anyway, my sense here is, is to notice how the sacred travels, right? It, there, there, there's sometimes this um, reconstructionist way um, that comes to mind, how we speak about the past, you know, and I'm always wary about the story that, this narrative that there was once a time where everything was harmonious, where we had this indigenous alignment with truth and right relationship, and then something happened and everything went wrong. And now we're trying to restore that relationship. First of all, it doesn't do justice to the complexity of the lives of our ancestors. Summarily, it also contains them in a, uh, static temporality, as if the past is done with, as if, you know, those lives are not still consequent, um, consequential and material and political, hidden constituents of our social material realms, even right now. It kind of romanticizes the indigenous. And this is why, you know, sometimes I find that um, in, uh, you know, in the recent upheavals and desire to center indigenous realities, there is a romanticization of those indigenous technologies that kind of instrumentalizes them for modern anxieties, like grabs them by the scruff of their necks and says, you know, here's climate change. What do we do about it? Do we take ayahuasca? We'll do it. Do we sit in the desert for seven days? We'll do that as well. But it's 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 like a museum, it's like a museuming, <laughs> like a like a quarreling or coddling of the indigenous. Even the naming the indigenous, I know it's useful for political reasons, and and divorcing it entirely from the modern, 
does not allow for the complexity of movements and shifts um, that are still happening, right? That the sacred travels, it's not that still. So to the question of right relationship, I think my, my heart's yearning is to bless that, is to acknowledge that, uh, that yearning, that desire for a different relationship that is not uh, supported by our modern suburban arrangements. But also to caution that sometimes in our quest to go back, we actually re-entrench or reinforce and reinscribe the modern. It's a deeply modern way of thinking to situate time on a simple linearity and to conveniently locate the indigenous in an originary Puritan past that can be resuscitated by some kind of advocacy or conservation, uh, conservationism or preservationism or reconstructionism. I feel that the indigenous is melting and moving and traveling and migrating, that the modern too is a form of indigeneity and it too is traveling. And that we cannot easily parse or divide the world between we're in an evil world right now and once it was good and fine and dandy. So that our work is much more complex. It's about listening um, more than just uh, restoring an image. Uh, so right relationship is, is, is as, as useful a concept as it can be um, there is danger there too. There is there's something not even remotely, but presently and urgently essentialist about it. But that still might do some good work in turning our, our heads, you know, our attention, our hearts, our bodies to a different cultural formulation. But nothing appears in the world that does not appear with risk and with tension. resonate with the problematic nature of romanticizing indigeneity. And I want to dive a little bit into this idea of post-activism and where you see us tripping. And I also want to read this quote that I think ties in with this, and it's from Let's Meet at the Crossroads from your Pacifica graduate commencement speech. And it goes, quote, the world has ended many times. I'm not speaking about extinction level events and spectacular arrivals from the skies. I'm speaking about all the ways something unexpected slips through and breaks the familiar so thoroughly. Like an accusation in Salem, that forward movement becomes impossible. Critically, the world has ended many times to make room for whiteness, the world performing imperative that enlists bodies of all kinds to perpetuate secure arrivals and safety. Even more critically, there isn't one world, one dominant already made world. The world has never been coherent or okay for many of us, and endings are plentiful, often happening at the edges of our tongue. Yes, it was good to listen to that and to be reminded of 
what I often call the Afro scene. Not so much the African Anthropocene, and definitely not singularly the Anthropocene, but the Afro scene. I'll make some distinctions here. The Anthropocene is the proposed geological epoch that is defined by heightened industrialization and the rise of the human as an organism superior to all others. It's the terraforming project of the man um, and the geological effects of that um, constitutional um, approach to homemaking, placemaking. Uh, but, but what that concept doesn't do well is, is acknowledge the legacies of slavery, of extractive capitalism, of, um, of pathologizing the desire to escape the cotton plantation, uh, of, um, of, the scientific, uh, of the scientific method right the the idea that the world is geometrically stable euclidean probably and can be known in any final way this liberal traditional humanist sense of things um what the anthropocene does not do well is is bring that in and fall to the ground to acknowledge the legacies of the slave ship um and so in its clarion call to do something about climate change, which is just one aspect of the Anthropocene, um, it makes this brazen attempt to wrap us all into its royal we, as some authors call it. So we need to do something about this. We are all in this trouble together. We need to get our acts to get, nah, that we, uh, it, it just, it's a, it's a mess, right? It's a, it's a monolithic heap of a we because it it doesn't it, it kind of lumps uh, the united states for instance uh, together in the same boat with zambia you know as if they were equally complicit um, that's one way of looking about it uh, looking at it and so authors distinguish the african anthropocene to talk about the other effects you know the racializing effects of the anthropocene um, in world politics today, in how the history is considered, and how knowledges are considered, in how our playgrounds and landscapes are still being terraformed by biochemical, um, industrial, economical projects of the West, right? And and how, for instance, uh, wind or rather air quality in Lagos will never be a project of will hardly be a project of the UN or World Health Organization, um, those, that data will probably not be found as easily as air quality will be found in New York, or rather data about air quality will be found on the internet about New York. Um, so that's the African Anthropocene, but I, I coined the term Afrocene to do some other kind of work, to invite um, a noticing of the more than human constituents of our politics today to say that the world has ended many times, like I say in that, like I said in that speech. And with the world ending and with these cracks emerging, we're suddenly, so to speak, exposed to um, the diasporic quality of our bodies. Right, so that in a sense we are no longer as composed as we were, and the idea here is that the human or whatever colonial project you can that can come to mind is not as resolutely stable for all time as we think it is. That when the world ends, when Hiroshima is exploded, when time stops something happens to our bodies. With Hiroshima, for instance, CO2 and, and radiation just blasted into the environment, settling into our skins, into the ocean, so that every one of us born after that time, I think up till now, 
has a little bit of that radiation from Hiroshima still exploding in our cells, right? Um, so we are changed by cracks, by events. The post, uh, the idea of post-activism is not a way of dismissing activism, not a way of saying after activism. It's not another post-project, right? It's a way of saying uh, that we cannot continue forward because the road is exploded. <laughs> the road is gone. And now we're in very awkward circumstances because the map, the terrain is no longer uh, familiar. Uh, vision is gone, plumes of smoke everywhere. Uh, there's a pandemic with the market space in our bodies everywhere right now. The public is haunted. That's the idea. And now we must meet these monsters. We must meet these alien bodies at the crossroads, right? Post-activism is always a matter of disability. Not so much spanking new capacities, but disability, where something breaks, that agency becomes distributed. That's why, in a sense, post-activism means or suggests that the territorial, agential, humanist, um, dissociated self, the citizen is dead. And suddenly, we are all exposed to these immersive waters. And now we now have to take into consideration what these others, these strange others are doing. Doing is no longer our thing. You know, doing is now a shared co-production of the next. So post-activism asks questions like, so who do we meet? Who becomes our new ally? You know, how do we even ask that question given that the future is broken? What does time mean right now? How do we live in a world that is uncertain, right? So post-activism, I like to say, is the creolization of agency from creole, a mixing, a, an estrangement, is that forward movement is no longer possible. We now must dance awkwardly. It's the proliferation of monstrous tentacles, Ayana. Uh, it, it's like suddenly we're no longer human, we're monsters. And we're now living in a time of failure. And the promise of post-activism is the political project of making sanctuary, where making sanctuary is not about, um, it's not about keeping people safe. It's not a politics that can be reduced to safety. Sanctuary is not safety here. Um, sanctuary is, from our point of view, how do we take care of the fugitive, right? We become the temples offering sanctuary to the criminal. So how do we gather around the criminal? How do we nurture this panting, fugitive, possibly a murderer? How do we make room for this, you know, disability? And what do we do with this place of uh, fugitive power? And in my estimation, that is one way the new can be sustained or can be supported. The danger is always that we relapse into the familiar, we get back to normal. Hmm. Hmm. Bio, that was just, I don't have words right now. I, at the beginning of this conversation, I was mentioning that after so many amazing conversations and so much research, I feel like I am more confused than ever, and really in so many ways at a loss of how to understand this time and how you just navigated this really bumpy trail that I think so many of us are, are conscious of being on was really comforting in, uh, in a strange way. It's like... <laughs> it's I don't know I'm trying to understand where the comfort lies for me in that but maybe it feels comforting because it's it's almost like the most authentic understanding of what it is to be alive right now is this way of not understanding mm. and I think maybe also when we're when you're speaking of 
the murderer or the the one that we're taking in it's almost like we're taking in that side of ourselves as well oh yes oh yes hmm yes yes it it's it's like we are we're imbricated with the things we're trying to escape from <laughs> that's the that's the trouble right there it's it's um it's the story of um <laughs> you might get you might get some chuckle and laugh out out of this it, it is this story of the of the atmosphere atmospheric chemist Jonathan Williams, I think works at the Max Planck Institute. I've spoken about him and his work for some time. Um, he won the Ig Nobel Prize. I said Ig Nobel. So there's a prize called, um, not the Nobel Prize, but the Ig Nobel Prize, which is uh, about scientific work that is more likely to make people laugh and then think, right? So that's the Ig Nobel Prize. Um, which is shocking because his work, even though speculative, is theoretically abundant. And I'll cut the long story short. It's it's about this guy who who is trying to answer the question, do humans contribute to climate change? Do we actually emit those gases, that those greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide? to significant levels to actually alter the environment. And his data says no, not to that significant level, but a new question emerges in the, in the meantime as he's uh, exploring that question. And it is about this gaseous entity that is the human because we're bags of gas, right? And he's asking a question about, um, is it possible to, to um, decipher um, human emotions through atmospheric gases. <laughs> right. So he gets this cinema, this theater contained and runs 106 um, sessions, 9,500 people, 16 genres of film, romance, adventure, blah, 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 The Hunger Games, you know, and basically spools air through the theater on one end and measures the outcome on the other. His idea is to try to, uh, in plain scenes, uh, detect the chemicals that are associated, that are emitted from the theater goers and are associated with certain scenes. And they do this and are able to come to some sort of exactitude, some sort of certi certainty um, that tells them almost to a T, uh, based on the composition of, um, you know, VOCs, they're, they're called volatile organic compounds. Uh, they're able to tell what scene is at play within the theater, right? So it's carbon dioxide that is mostly emitted and isoprene, another um, uh, hydrocarbon um, entity and it literally suggests that suspense is in the air you know one article i read you know put it that way suspense is literally in the air um and i think this is just shocking stuff this is beautiful rich theory making work because what it does is it suggests like Teresa Brennan would do with the transmission of affect, her book of late memory right now, um, that we are, we are atmospheric beings, Ayana. We are not just contained flesh. We are spread out quite literally. And that in a sense, we are participants in an ecosystem of feeling, right? Uh, <laughs> that shock and laughter and despair. You know, they were able to notice the parts where people were actually anxious uh, for the life of the protagonist of some given film they were watching. Um, that, in a sense, it's not just um, greenhouse gases that are floating up into the atmosphere. It's that despair 
and sadness and laughter and joy could actually become territorial entities. So feelings are more than just human products. You know, they are atmospheric, geologic, doing other things other than being felt. And so they enlist bodies in their territoriality. So joy could become a principality and a power. Despair, depression could become a principality and power speculatively, right? We're only beginning to understand the sense in which we are more than our bodies. We exceed ourselves. If we're swimming in those waters, if we're swimming in Afrocenic waters, if we are participating in ghostly becomings, ghastly becomings, chemical becomings, microbial becomings, neuroparasitological becomings, theological becomings, then it's not really easy to collapse the world to safety, to collapse the world to a sense of isolated selves, to collapse the world to pristine identities, then the world is undone, you know, not in a permanent way, but in a way that it that suggests that categoricity is also a becoming, also migrant, also nomadic. This is where post-activism does its terrible work because it's now about how do we travel? What new questions are, are powerful? What should, what should we listen to right now? It's not easily collapsible to compassion or let's just all love each other. Love is all we need. No, the, the universe loses that kind of moral coherence. And suddenly, even its physical laws shape shift and we're being invited to thrive, to die, to travel along with it. But I've gotten too far ahead of myself. <laughs> no. Oh, Bio, I am just so grateful for this time with you and it was truly medicine for me on a personal note and I can only imagine what all those ears out there will be soaking in from this exploration with you and oh, I really appreciate you thank you so much for this time and this winding <laughs> trail that we've navigated through together my pleasure my sister mm. so grateful thank you for listening to this episode of for the wild podcast the music you heard today is by zidzor and lady moon and the eclipse for the wild is created by iona young ali constantine erica ekram emily guerra and julia jackson Thank you.